praise the Lord. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if we could. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Remember tonight, 5 o'clock, we continue our journey through the minor prophets chronologically. We're in Hosea chapter 13, where God said of Israel, Thou hast destroyed thyself. So we can learn a lot of lessons from that tonight. And then John 14 on Wednesday night, we continue our journey where Jesus talks about the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. So two great opportunities to continue growing in God's Word. This morning, I'm just going to give us a little bit of a preview of the series we're going to have at Family Camp on self. As you know, the theme of camp is self, the enemy of victory. And so we're going to be talking about selfishness, self-righteousness, and um, many other aspects of self and how Jesus commanded us to deny ourselves and take up the cross daily and follow him. So this is just kind of an introduction to that theme to remind us that we are not here for ourselves. Amen? We're here for Jesus. If you're born again, you're one of his children. He is your Lord, and you're here to serve him. And one of the, the tracks that Christians often fall into, as we'll see in this passage, is this this desire to either compare ourselves to one another or to measure ourselves by one another or by our own standards and to commend ourselves. And that's, that's what Paul warns us about in this passage. So we're going to look at verses 12 down to verse 18 of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. But we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commended himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So commend themselves is the title of our message. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray you use your word now in our hearts to grow us, to teach us, and to change us. We trust in its power. We trust the Holy Ghost can now apply it to our hearts. And that we can lead, saying, truly, it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We pray that Jesus Christ, our wonderful Savior, will be magnified in this service. Every aspect of it we give to you. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. So three warnings in this passage this morning, and it's very important that we as Christians take heed to these three warnings, because I have found myself that we can fall into this trap so easily. I have people come to me all the time falling into these traps. The three things are to compare, to measure, and to commend. All of them are wrong. All of them are sin. So he talks about the danger of comparing ourselves to one another, the danger of measuring ourselves against one another or against our own little list of do's and don'ts, and then, of course, the most dangerous is commending ourselves. In other words, lifting ourselves up, taking any glory that, well, all glory belongs to God, as we'll see. And so we're going to walk through those three things in and try to make sure that we are not participating in these areas in our own Christian walk because they're dangerous. And the devil loves these things because they all stem out of pride. And as long as we're living in a state of pride, we're right where he wants us. Because Jesus said we're to constantly be living in a state of humility and servanthood. So notice the first one he says there. And by the way, verse 12 alone, this, the form of the word selves shows up seven times in one verse. That something. It must mean it's important. Amen. So he says there, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves. Compare ourselves. So the first danger he, he warns us of here is comparing ourselves. Let's go if we go to Luke chapter 18. And most of you are familiar with this. 
parable that Jesus told about the Pharisee and the publican. And there's so much we can learn from this parable, but I don't want you to see that this morning that one of the mistakes that this Pharisee made, he made many, but one of them was to compare himself to others when he was praying to God. Notice Luke chapter 18, uh, verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. What a thing to pray. Imagine yourself, you go into your prayer closet, you get along with God, you say, God, I'm so thankful that I'm not like those other people. What are you saying? You're essentially saying you're better than them, aren't you? And nothing could be further from the truth. If you're born again, you're fully accepted in Jesus Christ. And you don't know their hearts, but God knows your heart. And that you're in a state of sin right now because you're comparing yourself to others. And that's exactly what this Pharisee was doing. He says, Lord, I'm so thankful that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. I'm so thankful I'm not like those horrible sinners. He was comparing himself. Now go to Luke chapter 6 where Jesus warns us again about focusing on the sins in other people's lives. Luke chapter 6 verse 41. Look what he says here. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to put, pull out the, the mote that is in thy brother's eye. Yes, Jesus went to extremes to make his point, didn't he? Brad, you think you could fit a beam in your eye? Those beams are pretty big, aren't they? And Jesus is making a point. Why focus on a little splinter in your brother's eye when you got this big beam sticking out your own? And yeah, it's almost comical. But it isn't because it's sad because we fall into this trap all the time, don't we? We see these little sins in our brother and sister's lives. We're constantly comparing ourselves and saying, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. God wants us to look in here. God wants us to look in our own hearts. Those are the sins he wants us to deal with and focus on, not the sins in the lives of others. And that's the point he's trying to make. Another one, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. You would turn there. But I want us to get this point that the first <coughs> sin that he's warning us about when it comes to ourselves is comparing ourselves. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men more above that which is written, that none of you be puffed up for one against another. <coughs> puffed up. Putting out your chest. I'm better. Puffed up one against another. It's sin. And if you've been led down this path by the devil, you need to repent. It is wrong to compare yourself to other Christians. <clears throat> it is wrong. There's only one person you need to compare yourself to, and that's Jesus. And if you're exactly like Jesus, great. Guess what? None of us are. So we've got some work to do, amen? And God has some work to do in our lives. And that's what we need to be focusing on, not comparing ourselves to others. <coughs> Another word for that is envy, by the way. That can creep in there, too. You know, we're, we, won't, we don't just compare it in the downward direction and say, I'm better than him. But sometimes we compare it in the other direction and say, I wish I had what they had. It's still comparing. And it's still sin. So what's the answer? Go to Philippians 2, 3. He gives us the answer very simply. He says that this is the mind of Jesus Christ. Here in Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than himself. 
Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Wow. Here we have the God of heaven in human form, taking on the form of a servant. Why would he do that? To teach us that we're to be servants. That's why. And he wants us, as he says in verse 3, to esteem other better than himself. That's how it's supposed to work. And as long as that's our attitude, we won't compare, will we? I'll be honest, there's times when I have a, a tough prayer request, and I'll go to a couple people and say, hey, could you pray, pray with me about this? Because honestly, in my heart, I believe they're probably a better prayer warrior than I am. And there's other things. Maybe if I, I want somebody to be witness to, and, and, and I feel like this person can relate to them better than I could, I'll ask them, could you talk to this person about the Lord? I don't believe I'm the best at anything. And we never should. And if we do, we're in trouble. Because we're comparing. And that's dangerous. And so the first thing Paul warns us about is never to compare ourselves to one another, but then the Another warning, and we're going to jump to the third one and then come back to the second one, and that is measuring. Notice in the verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, but they, at the end of the verse, measuring themselves by themselves. It amazes me how many Christians have a list of do's and don'ts or a list of spiritual acquirings and if these persons have made it onto their list, then they're good Christians. And if they haven't made it onto their list, then they're not. But they're constantly measuring other Christians. And by the way, churches do this too. And it's dangerous. I mean, the average person walks in here in Rotorua, and you know what they find? They find us uh, kind of weird. We don't have rock music. That's already weird. As so few churches today don't have rock music. But they would consider us kind of conservative, wouldn't they? And yet, you, you want to know the truth? There are churches in New Zealand, Bible-believing churches, that look down on us because they think we're liberal. Where do you draw the line? Well, I just don't have any lines. That's the answer. You know, we're, we're just us, amen? And we're going to serve the Lord as us. We're not trying to impress anybody else. We're not trying to offend anybody else. We just serve God in accordance with God's word the best we can. Are we going to make some mistakes? Absolutely. Personally and as a church, we're all going to make mistakes because we're sinners. But if we didn't measure, there wouldn't be a problem, would there? Now, we'll go back to that Pharisee. When he prayed, he said, oh, God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. And then he went on to say, or even as this publican. Remember in the parable, the Pharisee and the publican went up at the temple to pray. And so he not only now compared himself to extortioners, adulterers, unjust, but now he says, and I'm so thankful I'm not like this specific guy. How would he know? By the way he's dressed, by the way he's acting, the Pharisees jump to some conclusions that based on his measurement system, he is a better person than that publican. He's made that judgment. But he's based it on externals, hasn't he? And see, that's where we get into trouble, isn't it? Because we can't read hearts. We're going to be so shocked when we get to heaven, get to spend forever with all these people we disagree with. we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Don't measure. The Pharisees, they were terrible about this. They had all these long lists about washing their hands at certain times and about doing this and not doing this on the Sabbath day. All of these lists, and those lists were so important to them that they even wanted to kill Jesus at times because he broke their lists. So they were even measuring the Savior 
based on their own measuring system. That's pretty sad, measuring the perfect son of God. But God says we're not to do it. Go to Romans 14.10, and most of us, if we're not careful, we will make judgment calls about our brothers and sisters in Christ because they don't tick something on our list. My friend, if I could give you one piece of advice today, throw the list away. I'm serious. Get rid of it. You don't need a list to determine spirituality because it's a load of rubbish. Spirituality is based on where your heart is with God and we cannot read each other's hearts. It amazes me how many churches think that the way to help people be more holy is to impose upon them a long list of do's and don'ts. And actually, you end up often getting the off opposite of what you're after. Because you've got people doing it now because they want to please the church and they want to please the pastor. And so they're not doing it to please Jesus. And they're not doing it because they think it's right or wrong. They're doing it to please man. And aren't we told not to do that? And what amazes me is they, they don't stop and think for five seconds, wait a minute. Every believer in this room, if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. Shock. God indwells every believer. You think that God is not able to guide that believer and help that believer to grow in certain areas of their lives on his own? You think he needs your help? By telling them, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be wearing that. You shouldn't be doing that. Where does that come up in the Bible? And notice here in Romans 14, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Verse 10. Paul is asking, why? Why do it? He says, but why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, we will be judged by Jesus, but not for our sins, for our works. What do we do for him? But what Jesus is not going to Say to us at the judgment seat, I'm sorry, but you didn't measure up to that other guy's list. You think Jesus cares about those lists? Not at all. So get rid of them. You can take nothing else away from this sermon. Throw the list out into the rubbish can. Amen? You don't need a list. The only list you need is the list we came up with in Sunday school. The list of commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you're obeying all 156 of those commandments, good on you. But I suspect there are a few that you might need some work on. And if that's the case, then quit worrying about what other people are doing. Get rid of the list. Stop evaluating your brothers and sisters in Christ based on their outward behavior, their outward appearance. And start focusing in your prayer closet upon your own heart. But to measure is, is sin. And so is to compare. Now let's go to the last one, which is the middle one in the verse. Verse 12 of 2 Corinthians. With some that commend themselves. <coughs> now this is the one that Paul spends the most time on. And you know why? Because this is the one that actually is almost blasphemous. Because God, if you go to Isaiah chapter uh, 42 tells us that he will not share his glory with anyone. Go to Isaiah 42, verse 8. Look what he says. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory. Will I not give to another? Neither my praise to graven images. You know, as Paul goes through the passage, he says in verse 13, we will not boast of things without our measure. He says, the last thing I'm going to do is boast. He goes on to say in verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure. What Paul is basically saying is, he's remember, he's speaking to the Corinthians. 
You know who planted that church? Poles. And then he stayed there for a year and a half, and he built it, installed a pastor. Now he's writing back to them to help them grow because they've got a lot of spiritual issues. But he's not saying, hey, I planted your church. I'm special. Because guess what? Everything I said earlier in the past one minute isn't true. Because Paul didn't plant that church, did he? God planted that church. You see how we fall into these traps? God planted that church. Paul was just the instrument. And, and God tells us this all through his word. Everything that we accomplish, everything that we do for the cause of Christ, we do it because God enabled us. But he's the one that gives the power. He's the one that makes it happen. Look, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 quickly, if you would, verse 7. And so what Paul is saying is, not only should we never compare ourselves to each, one, each, each other, not only should we never measure ourselves by our own list, but we should never commend ourselves. In other words, lift ourselves up and say, look what I did. And if anybody had a right to say, look what I did, it'd be Paul, wouldn't it? The greatest church planner in the history of mankind. And you know what Paul said? He said, I am the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15. But notice 1 Corinthians 3.7. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. That's why I don't like the phrase so many. And I know that puts me at odds with a lot of my brethren. I like to call it witnessing. Because we don't win souls. God wins souls. All we do is share the gospel and witness. And then God wins them. God saves them. We can't save anybody. We're just wicked sinners. We give them the gospel, the Holy Spirit convicts them, and then they trust Jesus Christ. But we don't win them. God wins them. And that's what God says here. Neither is he the plant with anything. Sometimes we share the gospel and they don't get saved. But the seed's been planted. Neither he that watereth. And sometimes we come along and the person's already heard the gospel a few times. And we're just pouring more water on those seeds that have been planted. And, and eventually, hopefully, they get saved. That's the increase. And who gives it? God. All we do is plant in water. God gives the increase. That's what Paul is saying here. Now back to that Pharisee. After he was done saying, God, I'm so thankful I'm not like other men. And I'm so thankful I'm not like this guy. He went on to say, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And he really doesn't pray for anything in the prayer. All he basically does is just say, I'm glad I'm not like these other rat bags and look how special I am. He never really asks for anything, which the word pray means to ask. He basically just is boasting now, Lord, I fast twice in a week. Well, that's not bad. How many in this room fast twice a week? And I get tithes of all that I possess. In other words, I don't just tithe my paycheck, I tithe everything. You know, the tire falls off my car and somebody comes along and says, hey, I've got a tire in my garage and you can have it. He makes sure he ties on that. He's a special tire. That's what he prayed. I fast twice a week. I gave tithes of all that I possess. You know what he's doing? He's commending himself. Look at me. Look what I did, Lord. You should be so proud of me. God says, so likewise, ye, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, we're unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do, Luke 17 again. Never is there a place for us to ever commend ourselves. Go to uh, Proverbs, if you would, in chapter 20. Just a couple of quick verses from the wisest man outside of Christ that ever lived, Solomon. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6. Look what it says. Most men will proclaim everyone his own what? Goodness. We're good at that, aren't we? Proclaiming our own goodness. 
throw that one out the window too. Amen? Because we don't have any. Don't proclaim your own goodness. Don't ever do it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. The second we start proclaiming our own goodness and think we've arrived, we're, we're ready. The devil's got us right where he wants us, and we're about to fall into the pit of pride. And we need to never commend ourselves. The Bible says in Psalm Isaiah 64, 6, All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We're not going to get to heaven and God's going to say, Oh, thank you for all those good works you did. Oh, I, I couldn't have lived without them. God doesn't need us. God saved us because of who God is. Not because of who we are. We're wicked sinners. But because he is love, because he's merciful, because he's gracious and and, and all of those wonderful things that we know about God, that's why he saved us, because of his character. He did not save us because we deserve to be saved. So after we get saved, stop acting like you deserved it. Yet I'm going to, I'm going to heaven and all those other people aren't because I deserved it. No, nope, you didn't. You're going to heaven because a loving God has cared enough to die for you and rise again for you. And you heard the gospel, and the Holy Spirit helped you understand it and convicted you, and you've trusted Christ. It's all about God. And that's what Paul goes on to say. Verse 17 of our passage, 2 Corinthians 10. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. How much glory does God deserve, or what gets accomplished on earth? 100%. There's never a place to commend ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 1 29, he says that no flesh should glory in his presence. And then 1 Corinthians 4 7, if you turn there quickly, I know I took a little bit longer than usual this morning, but I wanted us to get this. 1 Corinthians 4 7. Look what it says Who maketh thee to differ from another? Before we move on, that's a rhetorical question. And we all know the answer, right? God. Amen? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Another rhetorical question. In other words, the answer is obvious. God. Amen? So what's he saying? Number one, who made you different from everyone else? God. Number two, what do you have that God didn't give you? Nothing. Everything you have, God gave you. The air that you breathe every day, God allowed it. The abilities, the gifts, the strengths that you have, God gave them to you. That's what he said. So look at the rest of the verse. He says, now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? In other words, if every ability you have came from God, why are you glorying? God deserves the glory, is what he's saying. So you're a fantastic musician. So you're a great teacher. Praise God. Who gave you the ability to be that? God. And so God should get the glory. That's what he's saying. Why dost thou glory, in other words, as if thou hast not received it, as if somehow you generated it of yourself, which we didn't. Therefore, what he's saying is, verse 18 of our passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for not he that commended himself is approved, but whom the Lord commended. We're to live our lives in complete humility. We could go on and on the rest of the, the day giving verses about the need to be humble. Amen? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He shall lift you up, James 4.10. We could just go on and Jesus said that he is meek and lowly in heart. In Matthew 11. <coughs> We're to be humble. Which means we're to never, ever, ever commend ourselves. So three warnings in this passage this morning. Number one, it is a sin to compare ourselves. Don't fall into that trap in any particular way. I mean, we, we actually have 
major issues going on in our society today over this one thing, don't we? I mean, what, what is the one where women start with Joan? I forgot the word. What is it? Anorexia. Where, where does anorexia come from? You know where it comes from, don't you? People comparing. Because society says this is what typically girls should look like. And they get this thing in their head and say, well, I gotta look like that. And some of them, it goes too far and then they starve themselves, literally. That all comes from comparing, doesn't it? And that's, that's in society, that has nothing to do with Christianity, but what, what I'm saying is, it's a tendency that we have to compare. God says it's a sin. The second thing is measuring. Individuals and churches should never measure other individuals and other churches based on some list. Now, doctrine, that's a different story. That's, we're not going to go into that. But the dividing line should always be doctrinal. They should never be behavioral or based on appearance. They should always be based on the truth of God's word. And when it comes to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, if they don't do things that you think they should, or if they're doing things you think they shouldn't, God the Holy Spirit has the power change their heart. Amen? So don't try. It's not your place. Don't measure. Don't compare. And then lastly, don't commend. Never ever take glory because you're stealing something that belongs to only God. We have an example in that book of Acts, a man named Herod. Unsaved. He was in a big stadium. The people were all crowded around and they said, Herod's great. Look at how wonderful Herod is. Look what Herod's accomplished. And the Bible says he just sat there and soaked it up. And then God killed him out on the spot. And he was eating worms. And it says afterward, because he gave not God the glory. That's a pretty good learning illustration, isn't it? When God strikes you dead right there. <coughs> He did that to teach you and me something, didn't he? Never take glory. Never commend ourselves. So these are hard lessons, but they're important lessons for us as God's children. Don't compare, don't measure, and never commend. Just those three things gives us something to work on, doesn't it? Never commend ourselves. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and mercy.